everyone uh, for being here. I'm Lori Marino. I am the president of the Whale Sanctuary Project. And uh, I appreciate everyone coming out. You all do. And I uh, just want to give a shout out to uh, Aline Fortgang in the back um, and her friend Amy Webster, who supplied the delish vegan chocolate chip cookies. So wonderful. Um, and uh, Anne Presna for helping promote this, this uh, wonderful uh, event. And for all of you uh, coming out um, to, to talk about um, our project. So I very much appreciate it. I also want to acknowledge that we are on indigenous land. And I am going to be speaking to you for a short while and then hand things over uh, to Jeff Foster, who is our site coordinator, along with Katie Foster and Maggie. And just probably everyone here also knows Charles Vinick, our executive director. So let's get started. The Whale Sanctuary Project. Just going to take you through a little history to give you an idea of why we're here. What do we want to do? We want to build a model seaside sanctuary for orcas who are retired from captivity. We want to create an environment that maximizes their well-being and their autonomy and is as close as possible to their natural habitat. And as well as doing that, we want to help in any way we can to preserve and protect and keep the southern residents healthy. So let me tell you how it all began. And there's actually you know, a number of people here that I know for a long time and supporters, so I very much appreciate it. Back in 2011, I went up to San Juan Island and we happened to see this uh, lady. This is Granny, J2, and in 2011 she celebrated her 100th birthday. She's a member of the J-Pod, and at that meeting there were about 20 people, and the J, K, and L pods came together in a superpod. That was how the superpod meetings were formed. So that was superpod one, and now we're going to have superpod seven next year. And at that time, like I said, it was really small. Here we all are with our dorsal fins hats on. Uh, Ken Balcom and Howie and, and a bunch of folks in a living room and after dinner we all gathered together. And those of us who did research gave a little talk on the things we do and it was really, really great. And here's in front of the Center for Whale Research, where Ken Balcom lives. Um, and at that time, we, uh, were in, we were being interviewed by the lady on yellow, Gabriella Copperthwaite, for the movie Blackfish. Little did we know the impact that this film was going to have. And that's David Kirby on the far left, Tim Zimmerman, Ken in the hat, and so forth. So that's, those were good times. And in 2013, Blackfish comes out and takes off like a rocket. Of course, what precipitated it being made was a tragic event, Tillicum killing his trainer, Don Brancha. But what this film did was shift public opinion. It opened everyone's eyes as to what is happening in the tanks. What's the story behind the entertainment? And it played a major role that in, in shifting people's uh, views about SeaWorld and other places like that. And it's continuing to this day. The movement grows. And um, if you haven't seen the film, Long Gone Wild, you should because it picks up where Blackfish left off and has 
a lot of unique, updated aspects of it. It's a beautiful film, and you should definitely uh, check it out. It's long gone wild. But here we are, we're all gathered together, we all care about these animals, and it's 2019, and we still don't, we still have orcas in, in, captive, in captivity in concrete tanks. We know that the public opinion is changing every day. We know that this is now a global movement around the world, and in fact, Canada just passed this incredibly progressive legislation, Bill S-203, which bans the keeping of dolphins and whales for display in Canada. How great is that? <laughs> and on top of that, you know, I mean, those of us in the animal world, I mean, we know that there have been successful sanctuaries for all kinds of animals that people said, oh, there's no way you can do that. Elephants, bears, tigers, primates, everything. But there are no sanctuaries on this planet for orcas. Now, why do we even need a sanctuary if we really want to end keeping them in concrete tanks? Why don't we just take them and put them out in the ocean? Even if SeaWorld or, or a place like that said, okay, do that, that would be a real bad idea because these animals don't know how to survive. Most of them, the vast majority of them, have been born in captivity. They have no idea what a live fish is, what food is, how to survive. They have no social group. They have no clear dialect. They're hybrids of all different kinds of orcas. They've led, led a sheltered, highly artificial life. And to dump them in the ocean would be the height of, of foolishness. Um, they would not survive. So what we need to do to get them out of the tanks is do what everyone has done for elephants and other animals, and that is create an authentic sanctuary for them. Now, why is this so important, and why are we here, and why have I spent so much time on this? I've studied these animals for 30 years. I'm a neuroscientist, and I've studied dolphin and whale brains for quite a long time, and then started to do research on the captivity industry and what these animals endure in the captive environment. Um, their life is short, and their life is miserable. More than 90% of all orchids taken into captivity since we began this whole business have died. Free-ranging orchids can live 60, 70, 80, 90, maybe even 100 years. Average lifespans are 30 to 50. In the tanks, they barely make it to 15 or 20. Now think about that. It's almost like their life is cut short by half in the tanks. Not only is it short, it's filled with all kinds of maladies. Um, orcas living in concrete tanks have chronic stress and exhibit stress-related diseases, behavioral abnormalities, and all kinds of clear signs that they are far from thriving, they're suffering. How do we know? Well, we've done a lot of research on this, um, and many people have, and the science is in. It's not debatable anymore. First of all, we see that they show hyperaggression, um, extreme boredom, poor maternal skills, they, they just, you know, things that happen, things that happen in the tanks don't ever happen in the wild because they can just disperse. On the, the, the photo below, you see little Morgan, who is a young female who was taken into captivity in Laura Parque from the wild, and you can see she's not in the water. Well, why is she not in the water? 
because she's in this little tank, she's a young female, and there are a lot of aggressive males who are, who are really harassing her. And the only way she can get away from them is to beat herself on the side. That was it. So that's what her life is like. She now was made, she's pregnant, she had, well, she was pregnant, she has a little daughter who's not doing very well. The other thing that you see are repetitive abnormal behaviors and self-mutilation. These kinds of things are called stereotypies and they're familiar to anyone who works in the clinical health field. You see them in humans, you see them in all kinds of animals who have emotional disturbance. Um, one example of this is shown above. Uh, that is the jaw of uh, Kiska, who is an orca who is living in Marineland, Canada. She's been alone for about six years now. She's had five children and all five have perished in the tanks. She has absolutely nothing to do. I mean, there isn't even a ball or hoop in her tank. And she spends her time grinding her teeth, jaw popping on the gates, down so that she no longer has any real teeth. They're ground down to the, the gums. And then they have to be drilled out and flushed every single day. She's not unusual. The majority of captive orcas have dentition like that. And so imagine how this becomes not only painful for them, but a pathway to systemic illness. And that's what we see. We see immune system dysfunction, and then we see them succumbing to opportunistic infections, things like pneumonia, uh, candidiasis, uh, gastric ulcers. They're in, they're in filtered water, concrete tanks. There is not supposed to be any pathogens in there. What is going on? Well, we think we know what's going on. The chronic stress is affecting their immune system, just as it affects all of ours if we're under stress, and they become vulnerable to opportunistic infections. Um, and, you know, they're treated, but, you know, th this, is, this is something that you, you really can't deny. The fact that these animals should not be getting these diseases in the tanks, and they are. And um, I would just say that we just published a paper, a journal of veterinary behavior, in which we put together a model of chronic stress, immune system dysfunction, and opportunistic infections, and the effects on the brain in captive orcas. And if anybody would like to get a copy or something, just let me know. Um, uh, but we've, uh, I hope, made a convincing case that these animals uh, suffer from chronic stress in the tanks. By the numbers, what's the scope of this problem? Well, there are more than 3,000 whales, dolphins, and porpoises housed in entertainment parks and aquariums around the world. In North America alone, there are 22 orcas, 20 of them held at SeaWorld parks, 80 belugas and 480 bottlenose dolphins and an assortment of other cetacean species. Um, you may have heard of the Russian whale jail. Uh, and you can ask uh, Jeff Foster and uh, Charles Vinnick about that because they went over to Russia to deal with this situation. Russia caught uh, close to 100 belugas and orcas from their native waters and put them in these little pens. Um, there were about 87 belugas and 10 orcas in the pens. I think they've released a few of them now. But it gives you an idea of the scope of this problem. Why Russia? Well, because Russia is selling these wild-caught animals to China. Why China? Because China has decided to get into the marine park entertainment business. And as, of, as we speak, there are at least 76, 76, <coughs> marine parks in China stocked with cetaceans taken from the wild. So this is a huge problem. So how did we come to be here to talk to you? Well, um, back in 2015, we were all at the Society for Marine Mammalogy, and, you know, we just 
my colleagues and I just said, you know what, you know, we know what the answer is, it's sanctuary, and we know what needs to be done to, to make a change. Let's just do this. So we all got together, about 25 of us, and we planned the formation of the Whale Sanctuary Project for that reason. And today, in 2019, there, we have a dream team. We have the best team ever, ever. Um, in addition to having Charles Finnan as our executive director, we have uh, board members, Carl Sofina, who is a renowned ecologist, 50 plus leading experts in marine mammal science and veterinary practices, including such luminaries as Jean-Michel Cousteau, Dr. Sylvia Earle, Dr. Paul Spong, we've got Hal Whitehead. Not a single person asked has said no. I also want to acknowledge that none of this could happen, even at this, to get to this point, without some people believing in our vision. One of those people, Stephen Dunn, who's the CEO of Lunchkin. It's a baby products company in California. For those of you who have kids, you probably have some Munchkin products at home. And this, this man has pledged and provided a million dollars to us to create the sea, our seaside sanctuary, and they continue to be strong promoters and supporters of what we do. So check them out. So just going back after getting this little walk through our mission, our mission today remains this, to establish a permanent seaside sanctuary where captive cetaceans, cetaceans retired from concrete tanks, can live in an environment that maximizes well-being and autonomy and is as close as possible to their natural habitat. Is it free-ranging? Is it being in the wild? No. Is it orders of magnitude better than being in concrete tanks? You bet. Here's what an authentic sanctuary is. And by learning what it is, you also learn what it's not. Because a lot of people put up a shingle and say, oh, we're a this sanctuary or a that. I'm a chimp sanctuary, we're a bear sanctuary. Here's some of the things that you can, some factors you have to look for to know if a sanctuary is authentic. It's a place where the animals live, but also thrive. And what you see here is our concept of our vision of a sanctuary for orchids. This is not a photograph, it's not a particular site, but what it does is it contains all of the elements that we feel are important for an authentic sanctuary for orchids. A large bay or cove, a netted off area, in the distance a full service veterinary facility, Perhaps a place where people from a distance can see the animals, nothing up close, um, and all kinds of exciting uh, things that can be done with education, uh, social outreach. Charles will mention some of them uh, later on, some pretty cool stuff. We take care of them for the rest of their lives. Nobody is going out because they don't know how to survive. The idea is permanent sanctuary. No performances, no breeding, no unnecessary invasive procedures. This is their time. This is our time to help them promote their autonomy, to spend their day the way they want. Gosh, what a concept and to have as natural a life as possible. And we can do authentic education and conservation. We don't have to sell you a story about the animals so that you'll come back and buy more tickets. We can just tell you who they are, why the ocean is important, and why they're there. And kids can really learn about who they are. And we will be and continue to be, will always be, totally transparent. Because we have 
have nothing to hide. And as we go forth, we are going to learn a lot of things. And the last thing we want to do is keep all that information to ourselves. We're going to put it out there so that other people who have the means and the motivation can use whatever information we generate to help orcas, to create another sanctuary for more orcas, for belugas, for whatever animals they are interested in. So, I think I'm going to turn things over now to uh, Jeff. He's going to tell you a little bit more about where we're looking for sites and uh, some of the things we're finding. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lori. I see a lot of old friends and new faces in the audience. And uh, thank you for joining us. Um, one of the things that uh, we're doing with the sanctuary too is we're looking on both coasts. We're looking on the east coast for beluga whales and on the west coast for killer whales. And obviously we don't want to have the killer whales and the, the beluga whales together. So, um, so on the east coast, we've been looking at a number of sites there. We've identified quite a few of them. And now on, the, uh, on this coast, we've been looking for pretty much the lower sound all the way up, midway up Vancouver Island, up to Campbell River area. Dead Desolation Sound and Tofino on the outside. So what we were tasked to do, my wife and I joined the sanctuary about two and a half years ago, and uh, we were tasked with the job of trying to find a, a place to be able to put these animals. And you'd think it'd be pretty easy, but Seattle's almost doubled the population in the last 40 years. So trying to find a location where there's not a lot of private homeowners and, and the space available to keep these animals has been difficult, challenging. But we did narrow it down initially with uh, charts and maps, and then, then we went out to the field and took a look at these sites. But our, our uh, criteria was that we were looking for a site that's about 65 acres to a, to a maximum of 100 acres, and with a water depth between 45 and 50 feet, and no deeper than 100 feet, because it gets deeper than that, it's hard to tend the nets, and obviously that's going to be a really important thing to do. And we're looking to hold about 16 animals, so not, not a large number, but enough number, uh, enough animals so they can socialize and have enough space to be able to work out any disagreements if they have any. And then we want to make it this a sanctuary. So it, not only is it a sanctuary for the whales, but it's for everything that's behind the nets. So this is uh, like Lord was saying, like we have this with elephants and with uh, the big cats and, and great apes. But we want this a very natural environment. And we also want to develop strong uh, community partnerships. So we're working with the tribes, rehab groups, and as many people as we can, universities, uh, just to try to see if we can make this happen. So that was the first thing we did. And the next thing was, okay, can we do this responsibly? And the last thing we want to do is try to transmit any kind of diseases or pathogens to the southern residents or other any other animals in the, out of the water column there. So we talked to the leading veterinarians and pathologists worldwide and asked them, can we do this responsibly? And they said, yeah, I think you can. You know, these, the pathogens and cetaceans are usually transmitted through physical contact. And potentially it can be transmitted through aerosols. But aerosols only tra travel about two to three meters. Okay, so we can mitigate against that. Okay, so we checked that one off the box. So then we, the next one was, how about, what is, how about the social impact on the animals and the southern residents and other animals in the area? Is that going to be a problem? So we did a little work. And, from my experience, we knew that there was a uh, aquarium in Oak Bay, Sealand of the Pacific. Sealand of the Pacific had animals, they had uh, transient animals, northern residents, even Icelandic animals. They held them in sea pens there for over 20 years. And in that time, southern residents would travel within a mile of Sealand, and there was no indication that they paid any attention at all. And then the, the final one was the numbers. Now, how many animals can you put in there responsibly? And that's where we came up with 68 animals. And that, because uh, again, we don't want to impact the environment at all. So when we're on our quest to find a nice site and everything, we, uh, last summer, we were out up on the San Juan Islands, and we came across uh, J35. And J35, a lot of you should sure remember, I'm sure, uh, was a female animal that was pushing her calf around for 17 to 18 days. And we saw her on the 18th day, and she was pushing something around. We don't know if it was a calf, 
but there wasn't much left of it at that point. But at that time, she'd already traveled over a thousand miles, and she was she raised worldwide attention to the plight of the planet, southern residents. So that was a really tragic thing to see. But at that same time, we had another animal out there that was seemed to be suffering. That was J50. So we uh, sent in a proposal to National Marine Fisheries to say, is there something that we can do to try to help this animal? Maybe like we did with Springer. And they said, well, let's, let's, what's your ideas? So we, we went out to the tribes and asked the tribes, you know, can we get live fish? If we can get live fish, maybe we can medicate those live fish. Try to place the fish in front of J50 and see if she'd take them. So they said, well, let's give her a try. And this is so much, this is so far outside the box but that we were able to try something. And over time, we, uh, you know, we weren't able to uh, actually get fish into her, but we were able to medicate her and, and watch her. And the decision never was really made to intervene because it was kind of a tricky decision because we didn't want to separate her from her family. And one of the things we did notice that when they were coming in from the outer coast, you know, traveling into the, you know, the San Juan area, that she would lag behind. They would, the uh, rest of the family would take off about five miles away from the west side of San Juan Island, and they'd just take off the feeding grounds, and she would keep this one slow pace, just trying to, you know, trying to get a catch up with her family. So we thought maybe that could be an opportunity to be able to do it, but we just never had that opportunity to be able to, to treat her and catch her up and treat her kind of like we did with the spring, which is a, a success story. And since then, we've had a couple other animals that have, had, have suffered. Um, J-17 and K-25. K those, those animals now, we think are gone. Uh, but we do have one on their Kiki, J-53, and she's in kind of potentially the same situation that, uh, that J-50 was in. So at that time, we realized, you know, this, we have an opportunity here with a sanctuary to be able to expand on our footprint a little bit and, and attach a rehab center to that. And maybe what we can do is have kind of a safety net for the southern residents if in need. So we began working with National Marine Fisheries. We're trying to come up with an idea of how to do this. So this, and J-50 wasn't the first animal. These are some of the animals I've worked with over time. Sandy was a, was an animal that beached on the Washington coast. She had an impacted tooth. We pulled her tooth, and then she ultimately went to SeaWorld. Miracle. In 1977, she was shot by a fisherman. There was another fisherman out there that fed her, kept her alive. She had algae all over when we picked her up, and came in and treated her. She also went into captivity. And then we had, and then we had Springer. And Springer was, was an animal that was a northern resident animal that was out of habitat. And we were able to intervene with her, collect her up, treat her, get some weight on her, and then move her back up to her family. And that was a real success story. She, uh, had ended up having two cats and was really thriving out in the wild. Luna, Luna didn't do so well. He, he was a, a southern resident, but we never had an opportunity to be able to try to move him back into his home waters. He was killed by a tugboat. And then uh, CA-188 was an animal that stranded on Dungeon of Spit, and we were able to get him off the spit and get him out in open water. And then J-50. J-50 unfortunately passed away. So we, uh, so working with National Marine Fisheries, uh, they're the ones that make the ultimate decision. But what we can do is we can provide the staff and, uh, and the experience to be able to take care of these animals. And right now we're at a really critical juncture with the Southern residents. These animals are, are losing very fast. And if we don't do something now, we're gonna lose this, this iconic population that's so well known with the uh, Seattle area people and, and pretty much the world at this point. They're the most studied uh, cetacean population anywhere on the planet. And yet, we still know very little about these guys. And at this point, there's a lot of things that we need to do. We get, need to get fish into the system. We need to, we need to you know, try to uh, improve their habitat. We need to do a lot of different things. But one of the things we can do is maybe have a rehab center that can, that can provide a service to get with these animals in need. Currently, we don't have any, anything like that here. So, at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Charles. Thanks, Jim. So in a sense, Rory pointed out the rendering of what a sanctuary could look like. So that's really the image to keep in mind for a sanctuary. But here, this is really just a schematic to demonstrate a little bit about what Jeff was talking about. 
How can a sanctuary serve the captive whales that are residents of it, but also be available should a wild whale, southern resident or otherwise, need temporary care? And I want to emphasize that's temporary care. There's no intent to bring a southern resident or any whale from the wild into a sanctuary. Rather, there may be a need for them to have temporary assistance, some kind of help. So how could you do it? Well, the, the yellow balls you see simulate buoy lines that would be the buoy lines holding up the net for the sanctuary in the front of a cove, more in the other picture. This is just a schematic. And there would be two nets, one for security, one to keep the whales inside. Then you could have sea pens, one on the inside, perhaps one on the outside, where if a whale needed temporary care, it could be in a sea pen for a short period of time, as had to be the case for Springer, as had to have been the case for other animals. Historically, whenever a whale is determined to need any kind of intervention, to date, it's taken to a marine park, and they never get out. So the only purpose of thinking about this is having the staff available to provide assistance, veterinary care, other kind of care, out in the wild, potentially and hopefully, but if necessary, being able to think about being able to bring one into a sea pen for a temporary feeding or what have you to get it healthy enough to rejoin that whale's family. Now that decision is never ours. That decision rests with NOAA, it rests with marine fisheries. Tribes, other NGOs, ourselves, SR3, any number of them, can all be helpful in that process. But none of us make those decisions. We're simply trying to provide a centralized place where the equipment and the personnel can be available to help. So that's a little simulation of what we're talking about. Now, where have we been looking in this, uh, in, throughout the San Juans? As Jeff mentioned, and Lori did, we've been at this for quite a while. We've looked at over 130 sites through desktop study and physically visiting them. We visited and did due diligence on roughly 30 sites, both in Nova Scotia, here, and in British Columbia. And we've really, in this area, are looking today at primarily one site and possibly a second. The one site is Cypress Island. See the small arrow on the lower, your lower right? And Deepwater Bay is the bay on Cypress Island that we have begun to talk about with People who have responsibility for that, Department of Natural Resources has quite a bit of the land around on Cypress altogether, but also some of the land there. There's also some private landowners that are there. There are some leases held by Cook Aquaculture, you recall in 2017, all of the destruction of those nets of theirs and the horrible tragedy of their fish escaping. Some of that equipment is still there, but they are not allowed to use it any longer. So that's a key site for a number of reasons. It has none of the interference that Jeff talked about. When you look for a site, for a sanctuary, you're looking for an area where you have stakeholder engagement. This is not like building a shopping center or doing a commercial development. A sanctuary has to be embraced by all of the residents around there, by the communities that are doing it, and we can do it with a community, we cannot do it alone. And that's why Cyprus lends itself to being that, because there's very little development, there's very little activity happening there, there's almost no one using Deepwater Bay, we're in discussion with tribal groups that do fish there, and that's an issue, because they're important, their livelihoods depend on that. So we have to find compatibility for any site that we might use. So that one is one we're looking at very seriously. We've also had discussions and been looking in the Susha Islands. And so if you're familiar with Susha, there's North Finger, there's South Finger, and there's kind of the main horseshoe of Susha. And we've looked at that from a number of points of view, and it's possibly the case that between the southern, South, South Finger and the main horseshoes, there's some park service land there and the like, that's also a possibility 
It's more complicated than Cyprus, but it's one that's on the table. So it's not the case that we have determined that these are sites we can pursue or are able to pursue. They're sites that are strongly under consideration that we've begun to do more in-depth due diligence about and that we're looking to engage in conversations like this and we'll be having other meetings in the islands over the next few days to really talk about whether our vision makes sense to you, what questions you have, what concerns you have, and how we collectively take this forward. So I mentioned Deepwater Bay, that's a little closer picture of Cyprus, Deepwater Bay on your lower right. Here you see a better picture as well, a more close up picture. The two white islands, if you will, are North Finger and South Finger. The area we're talking about is really South Finger and the waterway between South Finger and what's called the Marine Park or the Marine State Park there. Now, let me talk a little more about what a sanctuary would encompass. Education is a huge part of what we're talking about. But how does education take place in a sanctuary? In sites like I've just described, Cyprus or Susia, we would not have an education center on site, nor do we need to have it on site. Could be an anacordance if we're over in Cyprus. And we use all the techniques of modern technology, underwater cameras, cameras from shore, virtual reality displays. We teach children about whales and about the natural world from the natural world, not from seeing animals perform tricks. So we can have all kinds of educational programs. In my mind's eye, I think of an amphitheater like exists in marine parks everywhere. But rather than there being wild animals or animals that should be wild performing in that amphitheater, it's a huge screen. And live from a sanctuary is what the same trainers can be talking about rather than the performances going on artificially in front of them. So that's what Lori talks about in terms of authentic education, authentic sanctuary. That's the kind of experiences that we can provide directly into schools, directly into our education center, wherever it is, but not necessarily on site. I'm not sure what's happening. Okay, it's a truck. I thought it was a plane, a boat. Anyway, what, uh, not necessarily providing any kind of interference in any way with the environment, because you can do it remotely today. And so all of those educational programs, I think, are a huge part of what we want to do, but we need to do them in a responsible way, and in many ways, it would be site-dependent. We could be on a site somewhere where it makes sense to have an educational center on site. That's not the case in either of these two sites. It may be the case in a Nova Scotia site, not so much in the remote sites in British Columbia. Another feature of why these particular sites are important we have experienced, Jeff and I had the, the privilege of being part of the team to take Keiko back to Iceland. And everyone who was part of that project expected it to be a temporary project. We would take Keiko to Iceland, he would find his family, they would swim off together very happily, and we would all come home. It turns out it's a much more complicated process than that, as we knew going in. But it's a very complicated process. My point about it is not that. It's that the remoteness of that site, a small island off the south coast of Iceland, was really tough, not on Keiko, on the people. Three months is one thing. Six months is okay. By the year two, everyone's saying, well, wait, I've got kids at home. I've got school they need to go to. I can't stay here for the rest of my life and do this. This is way too far away from everything. Part of our challenge in finding a sanctuary site is to find a place where our staff, volunteers, veterinarians, and everyone can be careers. They can have careers there. 
Children can come and do internships. Veterinarians can come and actually do their residency with animals in the wild, with animals in the water. Today, a marine mammal vet ends up having to do their residency in a marine park. That's the orientation they go forward with. We have an opportunity to change that, but needing to do it somewhere there where it's reasonably close to communities is a huge advantage. It's an advantage financially, it's an advantage for the people. For the animals, there are lots of choices, but that's part of the business side of figuring out how to do something like this that's critically important to the decision making. So I take a moment while we're talking about the education to point out the different decisions that have to go into this kind of a process. So what's our timeline? As Lori said, we've been talking about this since 2015. We've been actively looking at sites for two years. We're heavily engaged in that every day of the week. We would like to begin the permit process by the end of this year. Now, the permit process is arduous. Make do, I mean, these are informal. This is an informal consultation, and we're doing it all over. Once you start formal permitting, there will be requirements for more public consultation. Not one, not two, but multiple. So there will be many opportunities for conversations like this, for discussions. We have to do environmental impact studies. All kinds of analysis is required of the site and of the conditions. All of that is yet to come. We want to start that process in 2019. Now, I have been saying for a while in many meetings like this, that we want the first resident by the end of 2020. That's not realistic. There's no way that happens. Why do I say it? Because if you don't have a stretch goal, you never get anything done. So you have to be thinking that way. Realistically, it's probably 2021 and maybe beyond, but we have to be engaged in it full time, all the time, to get this to go forward. And that's why we're gonna get the permitting started by the end of this year. So these meetings are critically important. We do, as Jeff said, have some sites in Nova Scotia, potentially for beluga whales. We have some sites up in BC, but given the remoteness of those sites, if we can do something here in the San Juans, we think it would be tremendously important to try to do so. We're not there yet, but it's certainly a key objective for us. So, as we draw to a close, what has this been about? For, I think, everyone in this room, for everybody who has ever touched, seen, and I don't mean physically touched, but been in touch with a Southern resident, a whale of any kind, it impacts you emotionally. So for us, this is about also leaving a legacy. And we would leave a legacy for our children, certainly for our communities, for Washington, for the whales, and for the natural world. And we think that's really an important mission to have, and we're grateful for you to be here. Thank you.